Hello everyone and thanks for coming back for lesson 187. I bless the world because I bless myself. Now all of the th words that it's going to say in this lesson basically all reduce down to what you give you receive and you'll be much better off therefore if you give blessing and love and kindness rather than the opposite. <laughs> so here we go. No one can give unless he has. In fact, giving is proof of having. We've made this point before. Now, what makes this seem hard to credit isn't this. No one can doubt that one must first possess what one would give. It's the second phase on which the world and true perception, the truth, differ. Having had and given, the world asserts, okay, we've lost whatever we had possessed before. You've got it and I don't. The truth maintains that giving will increase what you possess. It's one of the singular, most major areas of confusion in the entire world. If we could clear up this one thing, wow, would it be different. So then it goes on to say, now how is this possible? For it is certainly sure that if you give a finite thing away, you know, something that you can see and touch, your body's eyes will not perceive it that's yours anymore. Yet we have learned that things just represent the thoughts that make them. Remember, everything that you can see and touch and that's in our so-called visible world is nothing but a reflection of something in our own minds. And then it goes on to say, and you don't lack for proof that when you give ideas away, you strengthen them in your own mind. In other words, if you talk about how adorable your grandchildren are, by giving those thoughts to someone else, your thoughts about your grandchildren haven't vanished. You think even more specifically and dearly about them. Okay? Perhaps the form in which the thought seems to appear is changed in giving, and yet it must return to any of us who give. And it can't be a less acceptable form. It must be more. So ideas have to first belong to us before we can give them. <laughs> if we're going to save the world, we first must accept salvation. These ideas that move us toward peace and forgiveness for ourselves. But we're not going to believe that this is done until we can see the miracles it brings to everyone we look upon. In other words, things have got to be better. Herein is the idea of giving clarified and given meaning. So now you can see, you can perceive that your giving has increased your own store as well as making it better for someone else. So we need to protect all things we value by giving them away, and then we can be sure we will never lose them. This is so foreign to our thinking that giving away <laughs> ensures that we have. We really have to wrap our heads around this. So what you thought you didn't have is thereby proven yours. But don't value the form because that's going to change and grow unrecognizable in time, however much we try to keep it safe. No form endures. Forms are very transitory like dreams. It's the thought behind the form of things that lives unchangeable. Give gladly. We can only gain thereby. This thought behind the form remains and grows in strength as it is reinforced by giving. So thoughts extend as they're shared because they can't be lost. They can't ever go anywhere. So there is no giver and receiver in the sense that the world conceives of them. In reality, there's the giver who retains and another who will give as well. And both must gain in this exchange because each one is going to have the thought in a form most helpful to him. What he seems to lose is always something he will value less than what will surely be returned to him. So now we're admonished, never forget we only just give to ourselves. Who understands this? Who understands what giving actually means just has to laugh at the idea of sacrifice. Nor can we fail to recognize the many forms that sacrifice might take. 
See, we have to remember that sacrifice is when we think something is taken from us or that we've lost something. So therefore, we laugh at pain and loss and sickness and grief and poverty and starvation and death. Now, somebody who drops into the middle of A Course in Miracles and thinks these are the things you're supposed to laugh at can certainly be confused, but this is coming at it from an entirely different perspective. So here we recognize that sacrifice remains the one idea that stands behind them all, that somehow we can lose, that something can be taken from us. It's like impossible. We're in charge of what we have because we're in charge of what we give. So illusion recognized has to disappear. So don't accept suffering and you remove the thought of suffering. Blessing lies on everyone who suffers when you choose to see all suffering is what it is. It's just like something we've made up. The thought of sacrifice gives rise to all the forms that suffering appears to take. And the thought of sacrifice is the idea that somehow I don't have. And it says this idea that I don't have is an idea that is so mad that sanity dismisses it at once. Clearly, we aren't sane because we think all this suffering is real and we think that sacrifice is being asked of us all the time by somebody else. Well, you can just see, here we are again, 180 degrees off from what's so. It continues to say, don't ever believe that we can sacrifice. There is no place for sacrifice in what has any value. If the thought occurs, its very presence proves that error has arisen and correction must be made. The error is that somehow I'm not responsible for my having through the process of my own giving. And your blessing will correct it. Given first to you, because we are endlessly blessed, now it's ours to give. And so no form of sacrifice and suffering can long endure before the face of one who has forgiven and blessed himself, where we have just decided not to see grievances in ourselves or someone else, where we have offered forgiveness, we've offered love, we've offered everything that's beautiful and good to ourselves and someone else. Where can sacrifice come from? <laughs> Nowhere. It says the lilies. Remember, it calls our thoughts of forgiveness lilies in that chapter that's about the resurrection. So these lilies that your brother offers you, that's when they decide to bless us and thereby bless themselves, are laid upon our altars with the ones we offer back beside them. There they are, all laid up together. So who could fear to look upon such lovely holiness? Obviously, altars and lilies and so on are metaphorical, but you do get the idea. The great illusion of the fear of love, like somehow we're going to lose if we love, diminishes to nothingness before the purity that we look on here. So don't be afraid to look. The blessedness we're going to behold, we're going to take away all thoughts of form. Form becomes so uninteresting and leave instead the perfect gift of blessing and love forever there, forever to increase, forever ours, forever given away. So now we're one in thought because the fear is gone. In here before the altar to one God, the altar means what I value, what I worship. One God, one Father, one Creator, one thought. We stand together as the experience of one creation. That's what the Son of God is. Not separate from that which is our source, not distant from one another, a brother who is a part of this oneself, whose innocence has joined us all as one. So we stand in blessedness and we give this blessedness as we receive it. The name of God is on our lips and as we look within, we see the purity of heaven shine in our reflection of our Father's love. So now we are blessed and now we bless the world. What we have looked upon, we certainly want to extend. We certainly want to give it out there because we want to see it everywhere. 
We would behold it shining with the grace of God in everyone. We would not have it be withheld from anything we look upon. Why would we want it withheld when what we give is what we have more of? And to ensure this holy sight is ours, we offer it to everything we see. For where we see it, it will be returned to us in form of lilies, forgiveness, as we lay it upon our altar, making it a home for innocence itself, who dwells in us and offers us his holiness as ours. Moral of the story, please, whatever it is you think you don't have, give. And if it's a thing, great. But if it's your blessing, it's your love, it's your forgiveness, it's your time, it's your attention, it's your smile, whatever it is you give, you will have more of. Practice that all throughout the day and see what happens. Goodbye. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow.